Hey gang, it's your old buddy Platt, and today I'm going to show you how to make bathtub gin. So let's go! So, I've been recently inspired to do this video for a couple of different reasons. First, I had a viewer leave uh, something in the comment section, just kind of a random joke about bathtub gin. And it kind of got me thinking, hey, can I make bathtub gin? Let's do some research. And I found a simple little recipe for bathtub gin, and I thought I'd share it with you. Also, it ties into a issue I've had lately. Um, in some of my videos, uh, including my most popular video, Simplest Way to Make Booze at Home, which is actually my first video too, I get a lot of pushback about, hey, homemade alcohol. I heard that can make you go blind. I heard that can kill you. I heard it's dangerous. It's got methanol and poison and blah, 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 blah. And, uh, you know, it's like bathtub gin. Blah, blah, blah. I want to nip that in the butt, so I thought I would do it in a couple of uh, steps. A, I'll start with bathtub gin because bathtub gin is kind of tied into homemade booze. Uh, the term a lot of times gets used as a catch-all for anything made, any kind of alcohol made at home. And uh, also because it does have kind of a sketchy history. Also, um, I will do an additional video where I kind of go on the difference between methanol, ethanol, what gets produced, what I actually made in that video more importantly. Because I think a lot of people, I use the term booze, they're thinking distilled spirit and what I made was actually just homemade wine. Back to bathtub gin. Let's discuss what bathtub gin was, how it came about, and how it got its bad name. Bathtub gin came about in, in, during Prohibition. Pre-Prohibition, gin was one of the most popular spirits in the U.S. Not a lot of vodka drink at the time. Rum had been popular during the colonial period, but post-Civil War and going into the 20th century, gin had become popular. Whiskey, especially bourbon, had always been America's spirit, but in the big cities of the North and Northeast, the rich, the sophistic, the uh, sophisticate, sophisticates, the, uh, sorry about that, the sophisticated crowd loved gin. That was what gentlemen drank. And when Prohibition came around and there was no more gin, that uh, need had to be filled, and that's where the bootleggers came in. Uh, what bathtub gin is and how it got made was they would take spirit, a moonshine or neutral grain spirit, or sometimes they would smuggle over, um, they would smuggle over distilled spirit from Canada. They would bring that in. They would cut it with water and add uh, juniper berry, which is the primary flavoring agent of gin, and then they might add some lemon peels or coriander, whatever else they had around. Partly because they wanted to disguise the taste of low-grade spirit. This was not the best of the best. Uh, the reason they got called bathtub gin was because the bottles they used to fill in it didn't fit in the kitchen sinks. Um, sinks were just designed different at the time. And they would use bathtubs to use it because they just used tap water. They weren't using spring water or distilled water like they do today to cut spirit. They would just cut it with some water, add some like I said, juniper berries and other seasoning, and let it sit for a couple days, and off we go. Where bathtub gin got a bad name was unscrupulous bootleggers would use rubbing alcohol instead, or they would use something called denatured alcohol, which was ethanol, but had poison or other chemicals added to it to discourage people from drinking. Uh, denatured alcohol would get used in, like, uh, fuel for a camping stove, stuff like that. But, of course, Prohibition, we didn't want anybody drinking, so they created, so you'd use, have something like denatured alcohol. But these bootleggers really didn't care about safety, they cared about money, and so that's what they started doing. Well, obviously, people got sick, hurt bad, killed, went blind, what have you. And that's why bathtub gin got a bad name, and bathtub gin became kind of a catch-all for anything homemade. So this homemade alcohol, even if it was safe, got a bad name because of this bathtub gin. Um, moving forward, how we make her, uh, how we're going to make our bathtub gin is we're going to take overproof spirit. Um, most people might know it's Everclear, but it's anything, any overproof spirit that hasn't been cut by water. Uh, what we're going to use is 153 proof grain alcohol. Um, and we're going to cut it with water. Uh, I'm going to, we're going to do a one quart batch. I'm going to take a pint or 16 ounces 
of this uh, grain alcohol. I'm going to cut it with 16 ounces of water, regular tap water, like they would have used back in the day. Uh, we're at 153 proof. We're roughly going to cut that in half, so we're going to be mid-70s proof-wise. And again, back then they weren't using hydrometers and, you know, they were just kind of guesstimating. And that's what we're going to do here. So let me, let me pour this. Alright, so we're roughly halfway. I'm going to top off with water. And then we're going to add roughly 12 grams of juniper berries and a couple of lemon peels. Now, if we were making a compound gin, uh, in one of my early videos I found a gin making kit at home where it had all the different herbs, spices, whatever that we use to make gin coriander, uh, cloves, cardamom, what, you could use a litany of spices. But remember, the bootleggers making this nice and simple. So 12 grams of juniper berries, a couple of lemon peels, and we're just going to dump that in there. We're going to put the lid on. All right, nice and tight. Give it a little shake. And we're going to let this sit for about a week. Now the old bootleggers, as the bird knows, might only let it sit for a day or two. Uh, remember, they're in this for money. Time is money. So they probably didn't let this sit real long. But what the juniper and the lemon peel did, which is again, killed the taste of overproof spirit or poorly made spirit. Well, like I said, we're going to let this sit for a week. And uh, I will come back later and do a tasting video. One of the things I've gotten feedback is... A lot of people are like, hey, I like your peach knot video, I like your apple cider video, I like your mead video, but how did it turn out? Show us tasting, tasting what you make. So what I'm doing now is every few weeks I'll take four or five things that, are, that I make that are now ready to drink and that I've done videos on, and I'll do a tasting video and I'll let you know how it turns out. I'll throw the link in here somewhere. And uh, this will take about a week, but I got a few other things. I think my watermelon wine tray to go and a couple other things. So here in a week or two, you'll probably see a video where I let you know how this turned out. Well, I hope you liked this video. If you did, please subscribe down below. Any questions, comments, or concerns, please leave them in the comment section. Or you can always contact me on the Twitter page. And one last thing, please like these videos because it lets YouTube know we're putting out good content. Well, until next time, bottoms up.